Well, good morning, everyone. You okay, Vicky? You don't need to sneeze again or anything. That was quite a sneeze. Sorry. That was special. Now, just as we just as we start, while we were singing um, that song, "It Is Well with My Soul," I was I was very conscious that sometimes it's very easy to sing words, isn't it? Words are very very easy to to sing, and sometimes. It's, it's harder to really mean them. So what I want to encourage all of us is, if you can say the words, it is well with my soul, and you can really, really know without a shadow of a doubt that if the Lord Jesus Christ was to return this afternoon, that you are going to go and be with him, that he would take you to be with him in heaven, that you would be there for eternity, then that's fantastic. But if you've got even the tiniest little doubt that says, do you know what? What does that even mean? Is it well with my soul? Actually, am I going to go to be with Jesus? This is the kind of decision in life. If you're not 100% certain, you really do need to think about it. And you need to do something about it. And I would encourage you this morning that before you leave this place, even if dinner's in the oven and you know, the, the in-laws are coming around, this is far more important. Okay? I would not leave this place until you have spoken to Martin, spoken to one of the leadership teams, spoken to somebody you know, your small group leader, someone you know who is 100% certain, and speak to them. Don't leave here without that, because none of us knows what tomorrow's going to hold. We do not know the future. Only God knows that. Okay, this morning I've been given the, the subject of Jacob. And over the last uh, few weeks, I have read the account of Jacob again and again and again. And really interestingly, there's 10 whole chapters given over to Jacob. And actually, when you, when you get to know the Bible, 10 chapters on one character in the Old Testament is actually quite significant, especially for someone whose life didn't actually start off that good, actually. He was a bit of a, a, bit of a character, a bit of a, a bit of a Jack the Lad. His life reads a little bit like a soap. Quick show of hands, who's into soaps? EastEnders, Coronation Street, Emmerdale. Come on, be honest. Hands up if that's you. Okay? Firstly, you're quite sad. Okay? And you're not as godly as the rest of us who use that time to worship and pray and, and fast and, and be in the scriptures. But we all like a good soap, don't we? Okay? We all like story. Yeah? We, story's part of who we are. And actually, this story is very much could, have, could be put into a soap. Okay, costumes would look a bit different because obviously it was, it was a little bit older. But it really is. It's got action. It's got excitement. It's got deception. It's got a bit of love thrown in. It's got all these different ingredients. And it's one of the many reasons why when people say to me that, oh, I can't read the Bible. I've, I've tried it. It's just so hard to read. It's, it's boring. And then you read stories like the life of Jacob and you say, how on earth can the Bible be boring? Have you not read this stuff? You know, if there's some of this stuff in the Bible, if they were to put it, well, they have put it into a film, actually, haven't they? They made the Bible miniseries, which was just epic. It was just fantastic. So never, ever say, I can't get into the Bible. Because if you, can, if you say that, then you're not reading the same Bible that I read. Okay, admittedly, mine has got pictures and everything in it, but no, it hasn't. Okay, but you need to get into this. Now, Jacob has this reputation of being a bit of a, a, bit of a homely type. He was a bit of a, you know, everyone said, oh, he was a bit of a mummy's boy, wasn't he? There was Esau, and there was Jacob. You know, Jacob liked to be at home, and he liked to be cooking with mother, and, uh, you know, probably liked to do the housework, and all these other things. Whereas Esau, you know, he was a, he was a blokey bloke. He was out there with a bow and arrow, and, the, you know, he was a bit of a Brendan, you know, probably played rugby. You know, he was a, you know, you know if you said football to him, he'd have gone <laughs> pansies, Okay. <laughs> Okay, but he was the blokey bloke. Now, what we're going to do? We're going to we're going to unpack that because actually, that's not actually all strictly true. We're going to we're going to look at Jacob in a different way. I'm going to encourage you to to take your Bible, and um, Ted kindly pointed out to me the other day. I read a different version. Um, I read the New Living Translation, and the Church Bibles are the NIV. But it's exactly the same. Okay, it's just I've got a different translation, so mine may read a little bit different to yours. Okay, so. Um, don't worry too much about that. But we're going to start with Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25 and uh, verse 19. Can somebody just shout the page number out? Who's got one of the church Bibles for me, please? 26. Okay, near the beginning, page 26. Okay, Genesis 25 
verse 19. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. You ever notice when you pray to God, sometimes you get more than you expect, don't you? Okay? Prayed for a child, got two. Okay. But the two, well, while the two children were in her womb, they struggled. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, why is this happening to me? I know I have. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. Just think about that for a minute. A baby with thick hair. I just think that's really funny. Okay, so they named him Esau, which means hairy one. People have never called me that before. I don't know why. Okay, then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. It's almost like that kind of, hey, you're not getting out of here without me. Okay, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Okay, and we're going to keep the Bible open because we're going to look at we're going to look a little bit more uh, later. Even before he was born, Jacob was actually a, a little bit of a character. He was even having a little bit of a, a struggle inside mum's tum. But he, when he came out, he was holding on to the heel of his brother. Now, the Bible doesn't actually say that much whether there's any real significance in that. I think probably there was. It was kind of that, you know, I want to be first. Hang on a minute. Okay. But there, there's a lot. We, we're not going to unpack all that this morning. Okay. But even before he was born... He was quite a character. And actually, his name Jacob, one of, the, one of the interpretations of the word Jacob is actually deceiver. Okay? The actual word Jacob, one of the meanings of it can mean deceiver. Now, a little bit further into the story, okay, they grow up a little bit and have been living life for a little while. And actually, Jacob, he actually does that first part of his life where he actually he deceives his brother. And when we first read it, we think, well, that's just silly. It's, you know, when you think what they're arguing over, or what they have this thing of. But we're going to read. It's in verse 27, same chapter. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game that Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for the rights as firstborn. Now actually, when you had a birthright, it was actually very, very significant in Old Testament times. It was actually, it was like a double portion of all that you would be given, a double portion of what your father, and in this case, his father was one of the patriarchs. So actually, his father was one of the founders of what we know as, as early scriptures, what we know of our Christian faith, our heritage. And actually, this wasn't just something you kind of just think, you know what, I prefer a bowl of stew. Now, I'm going to talk to the blokes for a minute, okay? Only because this probably applies to blokes more. How many of you have been out, you've been working, playing golf, been out playing football, rugby, had a really, really busy day, you know, might have been in the office anywhere, you come in and you are so hungry... You can't even think straight. You get irritable. You get a little bit grumpy, a little bit snappy. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask the women, raise your hand if you've ever experienced a man that's a bit like that. Okay? Most women have, okay? Guys, it's a fact, isn't it? You know, when we get hungry, we turn into bears. Yeah, we get 
all of these things, okay? I know that I do. On Friday, I had the, the benefit of going to, to Bedford while my wife helped one of the young people who's doing a, a, a health and beauty course. So my wife was like a guinea pig for her for the morning. And I had to wait, so I sat outside um, in Bedford and I was wandering around and I'd been up early and I'd had breakfast a long time ago and I was thinking, oh, how long, much longer is she going to be? And I could feel myself. And then there was this magic Greg's bacon roll and coffee, £2.50 <laughs> result. And actually, I, I turned back into more of my normal self, which wasn't much of an improvement, but it, it was a little bit better. Okay? But often we do look down on Esau when actually maybe we shouldn't because at the end of the day, he was a bloke. Yeah? Yes, he basically, you know, lost his birthright for some food, but we all make stupid decisions, don't we, in the heat of the moment, that afterwards we think maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. But later on, he, Jacob deceives again. This time it's a little bit more serious, and it's in chapter 27, and I'd encourage you just to make a mental note or write that down, because basically what he does, his father is, is getting a lot older, his father's nearing the end of his life, and he wanted to bless his son. He wanted to bless his firstborn son. And actually, a blessing was actually a little bit more significant then than, than, than we perhaps see it today. Because that blessing would have count, it would have really, um, so I'm getting confused. That blessing would have actually meant something. Because when, when, when one of the patriarchs, when, of, when, of, when, Jake, when Isaac would have blessed him, that blessing would have come to pass. It was actually more like a prophetic utterance. If he said to him that, you know, your cattle will expand on the hillside, you know, people will bow down to you, your family will be as numerous as etc., etc., that would have come to pass because that blessing would have been heard from God to give to that, to that family. But Jacob's mother, Rebecca, she wanted that blessing for, for, for Jacob. So what they did, and it's actually almost, it's funny, if it had been in a soap, it'd be quite funny because let's just take it, you know, Jacob... He's the kind of, you know, the, the homely one, okay? Esau, big, hairy, muscly. How on earth is he, they going to work this out? But what they do, because Isaac is losing his sight. So Rebecca says, we'll sort this out. What are you going to do? You're going to go and get a goat, and I'm going to kill it, and we're going to cook your dad's favorite meal. So far, so good. But then Jacob probably said, well, Mom, have you not noticed that I've got smooth skin? And actually, my brother, kind of a hairy guy, so what they do, they get goat skin, and she covers his arms with goat skin, and the ruff of his neck with goat skin. Okay? So she says, when your, father, when your father feels now, he'll feel that you're hairy. Yeah, but mum, Isaac smells different to me. He smells like the outdoors. Have you not noticed there's like an aroma about him? So actually what he does, he wears some of his brother's clothes. So when he goes forward for the blessing, his dad feels his arms... Oh, it feels hairy. Must be Esau. Feels the back of his neck, probably. <laughs> Smells the clothes. Thinks, this must be Esau. The voice sounded a little bit... I always imagine he had more of a high-pitched voice. I don't know why. I think it's because he was perhaps more a bit more homely type. You know, and Esau had that kind of, you know, um, Gerard Butler kind of voice. Okay, but basically they used this deception. This deception took place. It actually, actually happened. Once Esau got back from his hunt, and he went to see his father said, Father, here is the food. Can I receive my blessing? His father, actually, it says in, in the Bible, his father started physically shaking because he suddenly realized what had happened. He'd given the wrong blessing to this son. And, and Esau said, well, is there not another blessing for me? And he did kind of bless him, but it was actually nowhere near what Jacob got. Now, after this happened, you can imagine Esau is kind of thinking, okay, this is, this is not good. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort this out. I'm, I'm not having this. And he began to plot and he began to scheme. And if you look in Genesis chapter 27, just flip the page over, and verse 41. Genesis 27 verse 41 says, From that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given him the blessing. And Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, can you imagine how he's, Jacob was beginning to feel? He's this quiet, a little bit more of a homely guy, okay? And all of a sudden, he knows that big, strong Esau is actually in, he's after him. He's actually going to come and get him. So that would imagine, let's imagine, let's just take one of our 14, 15-year-olds, okay? Purely because I don't want to offend any of the gentlemen 
in the, in, in the, in the congregation. Okay, let's imagine that then they upset somebody like Justin or Brendan or, or Jimmy. And they know full well that, you know what? When that Martin Bow or the vicar's not looking, I'm going to have you. I'm actually going to sort you out. How would they be feeling? They'd be like, oh, my days, have you seen the size of those guys? And Oh, this is not good. So he began to panic. And actually, his mother said, okay, you need to leave. But they didn't just say, hands up, made a mistake, need to leave. Again, they used deception. So she said, her mother, Rebecca said to, to Isaac, I don't like any of the women around here. They're not good enough for my son, basically, paraphrasing what she said. I want him to leave and go and see uh, Uncle Laban, and he can marry one of the women from there. So that's what they did. He actually left. He went on a bit of a trip, okay, which, you know, doesn't look that far to us these days, but, you know, when you haven't got an airplane or a train or a coach, a bus or a car, that's, that's, a, that's, that's quite a distance to go. So they left, and he went, and he left, and he went to find a wife. And actually, he found, found a wife. And his life continues for a while. And he found this wonderful, wonderful woman. He, he fell in love with her. And, uh, and her, name was, her name was Rachel. And he said to Uncle Laban, you know, I'm, I'm so in love with this woman. You know, and back then you had to pay. Kind of like if you wanted to, to marry someone, you had to give something. You had to pay in some way. Okay? Which I think, you know, we think, well, that's a bit strange. But actually, if anything's worth having, I think it's worth working for, isn't it? It's worth, it's worth having. Okay? But actually what happened was, on the, on the day of the wedding, okay, on the wedding night, okay, Laban, okay, Uncle Laban, played a bit of a trick on him. He said, okay, normally you don't marry the, the younger daughter first. Normally the older daughter gets married first, and then it, and then it, then it comes down. So what happened is, with the, and I, I never could understand this, thinking, well, if you're in love with a woman, how could you accidentally marry someone else? But they used to wear veils, didn't they, in Bible times? They used to wear a veil. So actually, when, 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 uh, when Jacob laid down that night, on his wedding night, and he wake up in the morning, and I can imagine him kind of like rolling over in bed, thinking, oh, that's not the woman I thought I married. And actually, he had to work another seven years to get the other wife. But the Bible says, and I love this, it seemed to him but a few days because he was so in love with her. Now, that, that really spoke to me, thinking, wow, you know, I'm in love with my wife, but, you know, when I haven't... Uh, you know, it really challenged me. I was thinking, okay, need some work there. Okay. The story goes on. Jacob became very successful. He'd had the blessing. Remember, his father had blessed him. When God's blessing happens, God makes it happen. Okay. And his, his cattle, he, he, was, he, was, he was working with the animals. He was a shepherd. He was, he, they grew. Okay. He got more and more cattle, more and more sheep. Basically, anything he touched seemed to grow and be blessed. And this caused a problem for Jacob because Uncle Laban, his sons, started to get jealous. Okay? How many of us, if we're, if we're honest, when, when somebody else is really successful, there's a little part of us that is like, oh, I'm so pleased that they're going really well. Oh, look, they've got a really nice promotion. Oh, look, they've got a nicer car. Oh, look, they've got a car. We, there's a little part of us that wants to be pleased, but there's a little part of us that is a little bit jealous at the same time. And that's what happened with his cousins, in effect, with, with Uncle Laban, his sons. They started to get jealous. And Jacob said to, to his wives, you know, this isn't going well. We need to leave from here. We need to leave and we need to move on because something's going to happen because, you know, you, you, your brothers aren't happy with me. I'm getting more and more successful. I can't help it. It's God's fault. He's just blessing me. And all these good things are happening to me. We need to move on. So actually, he said, okay, we're going to go, but we're, we're, just going to, we're just going to sneak away, actually. We're not going to say, oh, by the way, we're leaving and have a party. We're, we're just going to go. So that's what they did. Jacob then heads off home. And actually, what he decides to do, years have passed, by the way, because you think there were seven years for, for each wife. That's 14 years. So, you know, this is a short sermon this morning, but it, it was a long period of time for them. And he heads off home, and, and off he goes. But the previous night, uh, what happened was... When Laban realized that he'd gone, he can imagine he wasn't very happy. You know, this guy's like been here a long time. He's taken my two daughters. Probably by then there would have been, well, there was grandchildren. And up in the middle of the night, they've all gone. And Laban is quite annoyed, to put it, to put it bluntly. So he sets out with his sons after Jacob. Now, Jacob's life seems to be a constant 
to in and fro in being chased after. But if you, I just love this verse. Okay, Genesis chapter 31 and verse 24. Okay, bearing in mind at this time Laban is really angry. Okay, he's chasing after them, and this is what happens. But the previous night, God had appeared to Laban the Aramean in a dream and told him, "I'm warning you, leave Jacob alone." Now. That, to me, has to be the best take ever on if you mess with me, you mess with my family. Okay? He basically had God warning someone, you back off of Jacob, he's with me. Now, I don't know about you, but there are certain people, you know, if you know that they were behind you, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, come on, you try it. Yeah, yeah, come on, I've got Jimmy standing behind me. Come on, you fancy it? Come on, yeah? It's that sense of God was backing him up. He had, and Laban, understandably, was like, okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Do, I'm not gonna do anything. So they continue on on their journey, and then, as part of this, Jacob has what I think is probably one of the most amazing dreams in the whole of Scripture, or certainly in my opinion. And it's Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. I'm just going to read a, read a, read the, the ten verses. It says, during the night. Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives and his 11 sons, and he crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hips, hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Okay. This, okay, this is where I'm going to sound really clever, but I'm not, because I borrowed this word off of Martin in a talk he used a long time ago. This was what we call a theophany. Martin, is that the correct theophany, okay? It was a manifestation of God that is tangible to the human senses, okay? Now, that's quite a big word, but when you think about that, a manifestation of God that's tangible to the human senses, I'm sure we've all had times when we've sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to us. We've we've felt God speaking to us, but this was a tangible expression of that. So the man actually, and scholars you know, disagree whether actually it was actually God, whether it was an angel, whether it was a, you know, someone God had sent. But basically he had this physical experience with God. And actually as part of that, he was changed. Okay, because you cannot have an experience of God and remain the same. It's not possible. Because God loves us and he cares for us. But when we meet with him, we're not so perfect that we don't need to change. Now, you will remember that last week, Martin showed us that slide, those of you that were here, and it talked about character, and it talked about competency. And I've, uh, I've borrowed the slide, okay? And if you can remember, we had at the top high character, okay? You've got your high character there and your low character. You've got high competency and low competency. And if you have high competency, there's un- possible unlimited kingdom breakthrough. And if you have high character, there's the potential for limited potential for kingdom breakthrough. But then there is also the reverse of that. So if you have low character and low competency, it leads to either low competency, apathy, and death, and low character, unlimited potential for harm. Now, Martin also said last week that Lee had volunteered to be the next person to to go through this process. And that was absolutely true. I did volunteer because actually I wanted to know because people are really good at telling you what you're good at. Okay? I'm sure you've all had people, if, whether you're in the office or you're teaching or you know, you're retired, whatever you are, people will say, oh, you do that really, really well. Because actually, we are quite good at telling people what they're good at. Okay? And sometimes we're good at telling people what they're not good at, but very often we don't always do that directly to them. We tend to maybe do that to other people. So I met together on Thursday night with a really motley bunch of people, I mean godly bunch of people, and, and they spent time praying and reflecting, and I was out of the room while they did this for 45 minutes. And believe me, after 10 minutes, I was starting to think, this is taking a long time. And then after 20 minutes, I was beginning to think, 
crumbs. How big is this list going to be? And then after 40 minutes, I'd actually read the book of Proverbs during this time. Okay, just to give you on, this was not me exaggerating. This was quite a long time. And then they, they came up. They said, oh, Lee, you can come back in. And it felt like I was at the doctor's. You know, Mr. Pillar, please come back in. So I, I came in. And I don't very often get nervous, if I'm honest. There's not much that gets me nervous. But I sat there. I was nervous. I was thinking, goodness me, what's taken 45 minutes? But part of it was because Andrew was there. And most of the time was in prayer and fasting. Um, but they gave me a, a bit of paper. When I first got it, I thought, oh, that's all right. Look, it's my bit of paper. See? Not much on it. And then I unfolded it. And then I unfolded it again. And then I unfolded it again. And then I unfolded it again. And then I realized that that was still in half, so I unfolded it again. And then, actually, this isn't really the bit of paper. This, this, this morning, I went to three young ladies, that, uh, my two and, and, and Omi. I said to them, can you quickly scribble a load of stuff on a bit of paper, make it look like there's loads of writing on it? And they said, what for? Actually, I'm going to read a couple, because I said to them, just write things about me. <laughs> and I haven't actually looked what they put. Lee thinks he's got friends. <laughs> Honestly, I've not read this. Seriously, I've not. It says, uh, Lee, Lee tells funny... St- oh, Lee does not tell funny stories. Lee smells. Lee has hair on his big toe. <laughs> I'm going to leave these out. Read these later if you want. Oh, Lee, Lee talks a lot. Okay. okay, got some talking to do to them later. Okay, but actually, it was a good process for me. And the things that came out, okay, they're between me and me and God at the moment. But I can tell you now that two of them, God had already been speaking to me about in the last two weeks. Okay, two of them, He really had. I'd been walking and praying uh, um, in the morning when I walked my dog, and out of nowhere, one of these things, I just felt God speak to me, and it was a very unusual thing. It wasn't kind of you know you need to pray more or you need to. Do. It was actually something quite significant for me. So when that came up, I'm like, okay, this is God speaking now. And all of the other things that they put down on there were things that actually, yeah. It wasn't just them as a group of people actually saying them to me. That was actually God, through his spirit, imparting those things to those people, and then God speaking to me. So how do we relate, you know, Jacob, you know, this, this, this graph, these different things, but... I think Jacob was really, really fortunate in that he had that wonderful experience where he had God deal with him firsthand. God spoke to him directly. God met with him. He had this experience of God, and through that, he was changed. But how today does God speak to us? There are a number of ways that God speaks to us, and two of them are through his word. God speaks to us through scripture. He also speaks to us through our Christian brothers and sisters. And actually, sometimes he speaks to us through other people who may not even be um, have faith. And we have an opportunity here as a, as a church, as individuals, to think, well, do I want to know the things that may be a little bit not, you know, maybe they're not so good in my character, maybe they're not exactly a competency, maybe they're a little bit lower down. And we can either think, well, actually, I don't want to know. You know, I'd much rather be told the things that I'm good at than actually be told the things I'm not so good at. But you see, when you, when, when you have that kind of mindset, you don't grow. Okay? You'll stay good at the things maybe that you're good at, but you'll never be as good as you can be if we don't allow others to speak into our lives. Now, that's not just going to be a case of, okay, well, let's just bring low to the front here this morning. Okay, all shout out the things you find you think is a low competency. It's not like that. It's getting together with a group of people, prayerfully, listening to the Holy Spirit, and then doing it that way. Because I can speak from first-hand experience. When you do it that way, God does speak to you. So I would encourage